Hi, I'm Tom Rosenbauer, and welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. You know, Euro-nymphing is one of the most effective ways of catching trout in streams under almost any conditions, and I've never been very good at it. So I've enlisted my friend George Daniel to show all of us how to catch more trout in streams using this deadly method. Oh yeah, nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly. You're gonna have to try it just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery. There we go. You may have heard it described as Euro nymphing, Czech nymphing, Polish nymphing, French nymphing, tight line nymphing, or as George Daniel calls it, contact nymphing. There are many different variations of this technique, but they all involve using weighted flies, a long thin tippet, and a colored cider leader instead of an indicator. Day in and day out, Fishing with nymphs is the most effective way to catch trout in any kind of water conditions. Euro nymphing is an especially efficient and effective way of fishing nymphs. In most water types, trout need to hug the bottom because that's where the current is slowest and they don't waste energy just trying to hold their position. Here they wait for aquatic insects to tumble by and often they don't move more than a few inches to capture their prey. Euro-nymphing gets your flies to the fish in the quickest way possible and also allows them to stay in the strike zone for longer. We're gonna show you the basics to get you started in this method. So George, you're kind of my, my nymphing icon. I mean, I, I know you hate to hear me say that, but you're a guide, you've written books on nymph fishing, uh, you do videos, you do presentations. I mean, you, to me, you're the person who really brought this European nymphing technique to the, the average angler as opposed to the, um, the competitive angler. How do you describe it? What is the method? Sure, the method is called a bunch of different things. It's called European nymphing, Czech nymphing, Polish nymphing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really no geography in fly fishing, so, <laughs> but essentially, there, I call it contact nymphing, and the reason why I call it contact nymphing is that instead of putting an indicator on the water, what we are doing is using, in the middle part of our leader, a brightly colored piece of mono called a cider, and that's going to be our strike aid. And what we're going to be doing is using weighted flies for the most part, so we have a direct line of contact. We're not using shot usually. Uh, when you have shot, there's often a disconnect, plus shot, as you know, tangles. Uh, so what we're able to do is we're put fishing the way of the fly, which put creates a straight line from the rod tip to the nymph. And essentially, we're gonna cast and we're gonna just basically stay up front, lead the flies throughout the presentation. Um, and as a result, you'll often feel a lot of strikes compared okay. to watching your indicator. The aspect I like about contact nymphing the most is you're in the driver's seat. When you're throwing an indicator on the water, basically you can mend, you can manipulate the fly line, but the bobber does all the work for you. But when tight line nymphing, we don't have the drag of the indicator moving downstream. As a result, you are the one responsible for reading the current, how fast or how slow. And what's great about this technique is you can go from a hydrology that goes from fast to slow. And you have to really study, looking at your indicator or your sighter, determining how fast or how slow. So it's a lot more engaging. Uh, and for the most part, people find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's just, in my opinion, a lot more fun. And you get a longer, more effective drift, right? Because because the water is always faster at the top than it is where your nymphs are. Right. And so your indicator is always gonna tend to try to 
get ahead of the flies and pull them off the bottom or whatever. Yes, yeah, and especially in streams that have a, a huge discrepancy between super fast and slower currents on the bottom. Right. When you have super fast, super slow on the bottom, when you put an indicator on that surface because of the surface drag, you automatically create an angle. You need a lot of weight and your tippet length is often exceptionally long just to compensate for that angle between the two. Right. But with this, we don't have as much drag. So instead of having such a long angle, we can fish more in a vertical line, okay. which allows us to fish a lot less weight, but then also it puts us more in direct contact with the flies. And your fly stays close to the bottom or you know lower in the water column for longer, right? Because with, a, with an indicator, it, it kind of, there's just that one moment that, you know, maybe that long. Correct. Where the fly's at the right, Absolutely. at the right speed and depth, and then it gets sucked away. Exactly. And the other advantage with this technique, unlike indicator fishing, where sometimes when you make a cast, there's a disconnect. You're throwing a mand or a slack, and you're allowing that fly to settle. There's no contact between the indicator and the fly. Right. So you have a sacrificial period to get the flies down. But with this technique, as long as you make a smooth presentation cast, which we'll talk about, your flies, you're basically fishing your flies from the very beginning to the very end. Mm -hmm. Effectively. Effectively. Yeah. Cool. Let's do it. Yeah. Catch Sounds a good. fish. Catch a fish. We'll, we'll try. <laughs> okay, let's go. Well, oh, Brookie. Better one? Okay. Euro nymphing works best on shorter casts. Here, George explains why angling the cast upstream is a great way to fish. So if you're gonna fish straight upstream, one of the advantages with this technique, it allows you to get close, because uh, this is a short range presentation. European nymphing, because basically we're keeping all the line leader off the water, we have a, a limited range, and usually within 20, 25 feet is the maximum range. And by staying and positioning yourself directly behind the fish, in essence, it usually allows you to get closer to a fish. The other advantage with casting upstream with this technique, with the Euro technique, it allows you to make excellent placement of your line leader parallel to the flow of current. Because what we're trying to do often is get the flies down deep in the water column. And the way we achieve a, a quick penetration or a quick depth of the flies is cast it in line with the current. When you cast across currents or down the cross, your flies immediately go under tension, they begin to swing. But with this presentation, what we're trying to do is get down deep. And this is why this technique is so useful in big waters like this, where you have ra raging rapids and fast pocket water. It allows you to penetrate the water calm fast. But the way you do that often is by casting in line with the current you intend to fish. The, the great thing about this is because basically there's very little surface drag on the, on the water. The only drag that's occurring is the thin leader right below the cider that's on the water. And as a result, you're allowed and able to fish lighter weight flies and water like this. If you're, if you're gonna be fishing indicators where you have a large buoyant object on the water, you would uh, have to put a lot of weight on that indicator or on the rig because you got the drag of the indicator on the water. But with this, the only drag that's occurring is essentially the leader. So it essentially allows you to fish the same water as you came with the indicator, but because of the less surface drag, you're gonna be fishing far less weight. One of the things I, you know, my mentor, Mr. Humphreys, always talked about is just fish in front of you first. So before you even step in the water, put the fly in the water where you would initially step in, and then you can work your way out. But as I'm working my way out slightly, I'm not casting across stream. All I'm doing is just changing my body position. So it just maybe one or two side steps. But again, what I'm looking to do is every current, every seam I'm intending to fish, I'm, I'm basically trying to move the rod to parallel with the flow of water so I can get that perfect inline presentation. So we're gonna work in close first and then we can work our way out. And then we'll take a couple steps upstream and just kind of zigzag back and forth all the way through the presentation. 
And the other great thing about this presentation is this. It gives you the ability to swing the flies. There are times of the year, especially like back home in central PA where I live, most of our hatches occur April, May, and June. I would probably say over half my strikes during those months occur on the swing. So with this, we can dead drift or get the flies down deep on the bottom right here. And then at the end of the presentation, I almost always swing, no matter even what the season is. Because there's usually always some fish, just as soon as that fly goes vertical, often triggers a strike. And then if there's no fish on the end of the presentation, the swing basically sets you up for your forward casting stroke. So there's no false casting. So we just drift, swing, tension, and then we have our presentation. And that's, in my opinion, one of the beautiful things about this technique compared to like indicator fishing. It's relatively easy to do. Uh, the casting, in my opinion, is a lot easier. It's not really casting as much as it is lobbing because essentially we have a weighted object. All we're doing is just pulling that weighted object through the air. So all we need here is the tension on the back cast, the hand out in front of us, and just flipping. Very little movement is actually needed to make this cast work. When George and I fished the Farmington River, we had tough conditions. The water was already high, and more rainstorms drove the levels up even higher. Not great conditions for fly fishing. All right, so we got a we got a nice little pocket in here, right? We've heard we've heard there's some fish in here. Correct. Neither of us know this river well. Correct. Talk me through what you're going to do here in this um, in this little pocket. Sure. What we're seeing is some above average water flows. And what we're trying to do is just kind of hit some of the slower seams. Okay. And right now, right off the bank right here, you can just see there's a little shelf, but there's just a narrow little passage. It's just holding some softer water. Mm -hmm. And there's a deadfall immediately above us. It's also creating some softer pockets. And we all know trout are looking for that salvation from the faster current. So we're just going to go in there, hit some of these softer pockets, and then I'll eventually transition over and try to hit that soft water below that large boulder over there. Okay, so you're gonna start straight upstream? Correct. Yep, okay. start the shallow and then kind of work my way out. Still, we caught some nice fish, proving how effective Euro nymphing is under any water conditions. We've given you a brief overview of Euro nymphing basics. Now let's get into more detail on how to rig up and fish and learn how anyone can use it to catch trout in a more reliable manner. You can try Euro nymphing with any fly rod, but if you like the method, you'll soon find out a specialized rod and line will make the process much easier. So George, you can do this with any rod and line, right? Correct, you can. But it's better to use something that's been developed, especially for this method. It's gonna make it more efficient. Correct, I mean, most fly rods are designed to cast fly line. What we're doing is basically casting leader or a very thin diameter fly line. So. We really need just a softer tip that lows with minimal amount of mass outside the rod tip. Soft tip, but you, and then you have uh, a stiffer butt to play fish and have exactly. the power. So yeah, you can see the way this rod flexes, that it's, uh, it's really tippy, really soft tippy. And it's gonna be ultra sensitive. You'll, you will feel a lot more your strikes with this type of rod mm -hmm. versus a traditional action rod. So that that's pretty much it, but you could use any longer Absolutely. Nine to ten foot rod, if you want to do it, it, you, it would it would work. Absolutely. Okay. We use a we use a very very thin line, and before when I've done this with a, a kind of a standard rod like a ten foot three weight or four weight, I used a leader that was uh, twice as long as the rod, so that the line always stayed right here right. and didn't sag. Because I know when you have when you have a heavier fly line. Um, when you've got line out there, it sags, Correct. and then it pulls it back toward you. You don't want that. So you want a, th a thin line, and we're using shorter leaders than I have before here because we don't need it, right? Because we've got Correct. that really thin fly line. Correct. The thin fly line is basically mimicking larger diameter monofilament. And uh, if you do have to make a longer cast, you can put that line on the water and mend it. And Absolutely. It. So the advantage of these longer rods is a situation like this where you're trying to get across that faster current? Absolutely. Uh, a friend of mine did a math study. I'm not sure if it's exactly accurate, but he did a trigonometry looking at angles. And basically what he was saying is when you're trying to hold monofilament or like a, a level line off the water, every foot you have 
extra in your rod allows you to basically hold it an additional three feet away from you. So there's a huge difference between like a, an eight foot and a 10 foot rod. It's basically six feet further back you can actually present the flies from. And in raging water like this, laying any line leader on the water between you and that softer current is immediately going to create the drag. So we're going to do everything we can to keep line leader off the water. And I can reach and I can hold that line right in that soft little pocket. Although it's possible to hack away with any leader using this technique, it won't be easy or effective. A long leader that incorporates a cider makes your fishing easier. You can either buy a pre-made Euro nymphing leader or you can make one as George shows here. We're gonna start off with a nine foot 4X leader. We're gonna cut down to approximately the OX diameter mm -hmm. on that leader. Off of that, we're gonna add OX cider material. Multi-colored multi cider, multi right. cider mm -hmm. material, yeah. about 20 to 24 inches. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna do a blood knot. Every change, color change, we're gonna do a blood knot mm -hmm. to provide points of contrast okay. to a tippet ring. That's it. And that's it. And then your tip's gonna be three to six feet, depending on the speed and depth of the water. Okay. Well, all we're gonna do is start off with a, basically a nine foot 4X tapered leader. We're gonna add an OX cider material. So we're gonna run our hand down the leader, this nine foot 4X leader, about five feet until we have the OX diameter in sight. Just eyeball this. We're just gonna clip this off. All we're gonna do is we're gonna attach our three tone cider material the OX to the OX. Now, what a lot of people will do is they'll cut the, these tags off flush. But one of the things I like to do with this is I'll, I actually leave your tags. So what we're gonna do is leave a tag that's maybe you know anywhere from like a half an inch to three quarters of an inch right there. And when you look at this from a side angle profile, it's gonna be a lot easier sometimes by just even having those little tags off to either side, just giving you a better visual. And uh, every change, color change, just do a blood knot. Some people like to do it every color change. Some may only use it once, but I prefer to sometimes add several in my cider. And again, same thing. Gonna leave the tag ends on half an inch to three quarters of an inch. And we'll just do that for the same thing between the white and the orange. So our tippet, our cider is gonna be you know, 20, 24 inches in length. Now we're just gonna add a tippet ring. This is just a, a standard tippet ring. I think that this one's about two and a half millimeter approximately. Doesn't have to be exact. And one of the things we wanna do when we're nymph fishing is have a thin diameter tippet immediately off the indicator. The thinner the diameter tippet, the, sink, the quicker the sink rate. And then also a tippet, as you know, that's level in diameter is gonna sink at a uniform rate rather than unevenly. So for off this tipper ring, I have an OX, but I can go straight from OX to a 6X or a 7X tippet because I have this connection between the, the tippet ring. The other thing I like about this, and this is not going to kill lysine, or one of the things I like about the tipper ring is it allows you to create a long lasting leader because every time you attach tippet you attach it directly to the ring. You never cut back on the leader. So like where I fish, for example, in central PA, it's, it's a cloudy location. We don't get a whole lot of UV, a lot of sunlight. I'll have leaders that will last me literally six to nine months before the UV breaks it down. So the tippet ring is great for allowing an angler to keep a leader for a long time. So that's just a basic leader. Again, we're just starting off with a, a nine foot 4X leader, cutting back about four feet to the OX diameter, and then just attaching our, our three color tone cider materials and at each color change we're going to do a blood knot to provide points of contrast but then also to add tag ends so we can float the cider at a distance followed by the tipper ring and then to our tippet and then the tippet depending on the conditions you can range anywhere from three feet all the way to seven or eight feet depending on the, the depth of the wire that you're fishing but right there is kind of the the basic leader formula that is going to get you started Tippet and droppers often confuse people, but the concept is quite simple, as George tells us here. Tippet length is determined really by how close you're gonna be fishing to you, mm -hmm. and also the depth of the water. If I'm fishing up close, and I'm fishing three foot of water on average, okay. and we're gonna be fishing basically underneath the rod tip, my tippet length is gonna be about four feet. 
if I'm fishing big water, like on the Farmington, where I can't get up on the fish, but I have to cast further out and at an angle. Right. Usually the tippet length is going to be about twice the length of the average depth of the I'm okay. fishing. And four, five, six X, depending on the size of the flies in the water. And Correct. Uh, Normally four X is pretty good in basically high water. Uh, Normally back home, normally 5X, 6X is probably my go-to diameters. And we have the clinch knot with our OX, slider material. Again, the nice thing about the tippet ring, it allows us to attach a level section of tippet material. And the idea with the level diameter is everything's going to sink at a quick sink rate. I like fluorocarbon just not because uh, of the invisibility factor, but because of the abrasion. Uh, resistance, you're going to be pulling, your tip is going to be underneath the water, obviously, going against rocks, hard substrate, and so forth. And I find that fluorocarbon is far more abrasive resistant than nylon. Yep. So I lose far fewer flies. Mm -hmm. And it sinks a little quicker. Exactly. Now, you're just doing a standard clinch? To just doing a standard clinch knot. Not, Correct. not an improved clinch. Not an improved clinch. Uh -huh. No, I find that the standard clinch, as long as the tag ends are pulled tight, I yeah. find it just to be just as strong as an improved clinch. Yeah. Now, we can fish one fly or we can fish two flies. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're fishing three foot of water, you know, we have a four foot section of tippet right here. Mm -hmm. So, this is where my point fly is going to be. If I want to add a second fly, I start off with four feet and then what I'm going to do is just run my hand up the leader to wherever I want to add a dropper. And we're just going to add another section of 5X using a surgeon's knot. Take off about 8 to 10 inches. And wherever I want to add that dropper, we're just going to do a two-turn Orvis tippet knot. That's it. That's your... That's your upper fly or that's your my, dropper? That's my upper fly. And your point fly is on right. the end there. And eventually, if you change your flies enough with a dropper, you, all you need to do is just, when this gets short and stubby, just yep. trim this off. Yep. And you can pull off another section of 4 or 5 X. Mm -hmm. And then you can basically do a, a clinch knot. Around, around the standing part. Around the stand leader. part and slide it down. Mm -hmm. And that just allows you to keep the, the dropper going. Is a rainbow, and it took the upper fly, which is an ugly purple, purple nymph with a pink bead at the head. More of a rain, more of what you'd think of as a rainbow fly instead of the mop fly. Yep, cute little rainbow. Looks like it could be a wild fish too. It has nice colors on it, clean fins. We all agonize over fly choice, but take a lesson from George. He keeps his fly selection simple, as instead of trying to match the hatch with a specific fly, in Euro nymphing, you're just trying to get something that looks tasty in front of a trout. It's much more about getting the fly down to the fish with depth control than it is about using the perfect fly pattern. But George, um, talk a little bit about the flies used. Now, you can theoretically use any heavily weighted fly for this, right? They don't have to be tied on jig hooks. You Correct. can use a standard B-dead prints or whatever. Correct. This kind of fishing. Yeah. But a lot of people use um, specialized flies. Actually, they're not specialized. They're more generic patterns, right? They're kind Correct. of almost nymph attractors. Exactly. Um, how do you rationalize what, what fly to pick? Basically, what I'm looking at is I fish about a dozen styles of flies, no matter where I go. Mm -hmm. um, I just have some varieties of pheasant tails, hare's ears, uh, to cover most of my mayfly imitations. Mm -hmm. I have some soft tackle patterns to imitate some caddis, along with some case caddis. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I have worms and what they refer to as junk flies for dirty water conditions or any time where fish are actually feeding on uh, floating worms. Right. For the most part, I'm looking at a fly more from a depth standpoint. Okay. I weight my flies according to three distinct weight classes. Okay. Most of my flies in the heavier section here are tied with a 532nd bead. Mm -hmm. Tungsten, this next one is tied with a 764, one size smaller. And the next box is tied with a 332nd. Okay. So right there, I have three ways of adjusting my depth. Most of the time, I put the heavier fly on the point. Putting the heavier fly on the point keeps a 
the entire rig tight from the rod tip to the nymph. Also, when you fish, have your fly in the point, the lighter weight fly in the drop on the dropper, you're fishing two distinct levels in the presentation. So keeps it tight and you fish two levels. George, we talked um, a bit about weight in flies and um, are there other considerations regarding the profile of the fly for, for getting it down? Absolutely, what we're trying to go for, for the most part is just trying to create as thin and as dense of a body as possible that's just going to quickly penetrate through the water column mm -hmm. to achieve depth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you obviously want the fuzzy flies floating more in the water column mm -hmm. for emergers, but anytime you're looking to achieve a, a deep drift uh, as close to the bottom, try to strive for thin and dense bodies. Okay, what would you consider a, a thin and dense fly? This is a style of fly called the Pertigum. Uh -huh. It's just a hard body fly. It can be, the body can be constructed of thread or a floss mm -hmm. that's coated with a UV uh -huh. resin, yep. hit with a light. But just something that's, again, just very thin in diameter. This is just a V-rib nymph. It's a hard body nymph, but yeah. you can see the dubbed collar. Yeah. And that's going to sink at a much slower rate than the Pertigum. Okay. Okay. Great. Good to know. Oh, it's so, uh, had to get out there in that fast water, try to get towards the thaw wag. Casting with this method is different and actually easier than traditional fly casting. However, if you spend a lifetime casting conventional fly lines, you need to break some old habits like I did. So George, tell me about the cast. Obviously, it's to me it seems stealthier. There's a quick flip, boom, the fly's in the water. You're not doing any false casting, so you're not moving your arms a lot. Um, wh what, are you, what are you trying to do with the cast? With the cast, what we're trying to do is fling a decent amount of weight forward but do it in a smooth manner where the rod tip stops high and the line leader is off the water from the very beginning. And when we're doing this, basically, everything you've learned about traditional casting goes out the door because it's not casting as much as it is more of a flop. Uh huh. Everything is a tension here. So because we don't have mass in the leader or in the line, right. all we need to do is we need to have tension on the back cast, okay. essentially that line hanging off the rod tip. Right. These rods, these long nymphing rods, are designed for just a short load at the tip. All you need to do with this cast, and what I like to do is just keep my hand out in front, keeping the wrist cocked back. Yeah. And all we're gonna do is just a smooth fling. That's it, either the finger or the rod tip goes over top. But the key here, to have that sighter in vision, in, your, in sight from the very start, is you need to stop with the rod tip high. So when you start, when you cast here, the hand's gonna start low, yeah. and all we're gonna do is just flick it up. And there's no body movement. Everyone wants to try to power cast this. And when you power cast this, the shock, the, the line leader get discombobulated, yeah, you have it slack, it bounces back. and then you don't have control here to the very end. Right. If you can just learn to let the rod do all the work for you, you're gonna have control from the very beginning here. So all of this is, again, it's just keeping this elbow in. And anytime you're fishing a heavily weighted flies or a heavily weighted rig, you know, the, the basically the 180 degree rule. So wherever you want your flies to go in the forward stroke, we just need to bring the flies back so it's a straight line from in front to behind. Hands in front and just a smooth flip. And now you've got your eye on the cider the cider. whole time. It doesn't pile up in Correct. front or anything. That's it, okay. it's, it's smooth. That's all we're doing. Here, George critiques my casting and presentation. Hopefully, you'll be able to learn from the suggestions he gives me. So, George, we've had um, a little gusts of wind here, and uh, you know, keeping the keeping the rod eye, it starts to blow the cider around and uh, starts to feel a little like things aren't happening right, right. <laughs> when the wind blows. Um, what do you do? I mean, what do you do when you got when you got a sail out there underneath your rod tip? Well, there's at least two things we can do. One is, obviously wind is the biggest nemesis to the tight line or yeah. contact nymph angler. Yeah. 
The first thing we can do is just making sure that we maintain some degree of tension from the very start of the cast to the lead on the flies. Anytime you incorporate an ounce of slack in that line, the wind's going to create a bow. Right. So you can see how there's a disconnect right there, and that's yeah. a result of you casting and turning simultaneously and creating kind of a jerky motion. If I can just have you just, I'm making a jerky motion? Just, Excuse just, me. As as my as <laughs> as my mentor, Mr. Humphrey, says, let's eliminate the jerk kind of thing. <laughs> so one of the things I would like to see you do when you're making the cast, just yeah. let the fly line fall behind you, okay? You're, you're dropping your left shoulder just a little bit. Now, what I would like to see, instead of using a very short erratic motion, I want the hand extending out, keeping the hand out, and all we're doing is just flipping the wrist. And as soon as we flip the wrist, all we're gonna do is just immediately, almost like a downstream reach cast, just flip and just begin sliding the hand downstream. Hold it high and begin sliding downstream. Now you have tension right from the very start. Right. Now, in minimal amounts of wind, that's going to be okay. Uh, but that's the first thing is just not giving the wind any slack in the presentation. Okay, so. Immediately, yeah. Immediately, yeah. And maintain tension. And often too, with that wind, one of the things you can do is you can place that cider on that water. And because that cider has those knots, mm -hmm. it creates an anchor and it kind of holds that line tight on the water. So that's the other advantage of the knotted sections, the tag ends on that cider, it creates an anchor for your cider during the wind. And the big part after the cast is made is kind of the line control. Because sometimes all you're looking for is just a little hesitation at cider. Yeah. And what happens is the biggest complaint about tight line nymphing is people will make a cast and they hold their hand all the way out. Yeah. And I don't care how old you are or how great a shape you're in, in about 20 minutes of doing that, your shoulder is going to be burning yeah. and your hand's going to be shaking. And That's when what I've been doing. Yeah. So all we need to do, one of my favorite things to do, as long as you can get fairly close, uh -huh. is just use, a, use your hips. So once I make the cast, I flip, but I keep my elbow locked in. It's this very comfortable position. Okay. And all we're going to do now is just actually utilize the hips and the shoulders to rotate. So I'm using the larger muscle to lead the flies while my hand is in a comfortable position. Okay. And what, you, what you'll see here... So your rod tip is going to be cocked up. Cocked up, and yeah. all I'm doing now is just rotate, but you can see how smooth and controlled yeah. that cider is during the presentation. Yep. And any hesitation on that cider, I know, is the reason I set the hook. Okay. Now sometimes I know that you kind of sort of make a false cast, or false cast or you dump it in the water behind you? Yeah. So sometimes, again, it's all about your angles. Right. If your presentation ends here and I want to cast straight across, all yeah. I'm going to do is, that's all I'm doing is just changing my Just my dumping anchor. it behind you yep. to get some tension on just it. Just changing my anchor point okay. so I can make the cast. Okay. That's and, it, huh? Yeah. And the other... It's a flip of the wrist. The flip of the wrist. And the other thing we can do too, instead of doing a highly overpowered tuck, Yep. Where we're throwing shock in there. Yep. One of the ways we can increase the speed that the flies enter the water is by just simply hauling on the line. Uh huh. So it's just again, it's a smooth flip, but all I'm going to do is just haul, and you can see how those flies just drop like a rock now. So the haul, what does the haul do? The haul um, help is help you just, in longer, a little bit longer cast. The haul, it can give you a little bit longer cast, but what it's going to do is going to speed up the presentation of the flies entering the water, allowing the flies. So and you go when you oh, go so it pushes yeah. them down in more. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So in okay. skinny water, yep. my flip might just be a smooth, just subtle flip, flip like that because I don't want my flies to enter too fast. Right. And then when I go into deeper water, and I want my flies to get down fast. I'm going to incorporate the hull. That same, but so just, that gives you the tuck. Exactly. And the flies come in kind of under the cider. So exactly. That they get buried quickly. So those are instead of adding weight or going to a heavier fly, the first thing I like to do when I'm making a depth present change is just changing the speed that my flies enter the water column. Okay. Part of line control is to know how fast to retrieve line as the flies drift. George alternates between a hand twist retrieve and normal line stripping. I notice you like to hand twist the line as it comes back. I do in these slower pockets. Uh -huh. The hand and twist gives you a lot more control, in my opinion. Uh -huh. 
and I like having my hands in front of me, so often, just like a strip set, so if a fish does strike, I also have the line hand and also the rod to set the hook. Okay. Sometimes in faster water, if you have a faster current, I'll make one or two long strips with the line hand, get in control, and then as the drift slows down, then go into a slow, steady hand and twist retrieve. Okay. The thing I like about the hand and twist retrieve as well is we're fishing jig flies. So one of the things we can do actually with the rod tip, without jigging with the rod tip, I can actually overpower the hand. Mm -hmm. Just like this, I can literally jig the flies with my hand. You can see how that cider is bouncing up and down. Yeah. And all I'm yeah. doing is just animating those flies. Mm -hmm. But they're staying in the same current lane, so they're not looking like they're dragging Ex or anything. Exactly. Okay. One of the downfalls with the rod tip when you jig up is you put slack in there and the flies have to drop. But you're exactly right. You can pop it in there and then I can over basically manipulate the line hand. Mm -hmm. and I can manipulate those flies, move the flies, but still keep them in the water column. One of the fine points I didn't catch on to right away is that in order to stay in tight control of the flies at all times, you need to lead the downstream progress of the flies with your rod tip. Otherwise, you'll develop slack and won't detect strikes. I mean, start low. You're starting way too high. Low, pitch it up. There you go. Now you need to strip in line, quick strip, and I'll lead. Just like lead, quick downstream reach. There you go. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I didn't realize you needed to be ahead of it that much. Yep, absolutely. Now you're okay. now you're in the ball game. And in deep water, you need to develop some slack first. So at times, a lower rod tip earlier in the drift can help. But George, what am I doing wrong here? It just doesn't it doesn't feel right. So it doesn't feel like I'm always getting down and the one thing i would just change it's nothing wrong but we just need to switch based on the conditions you see how when you're making the cast you're immediately pulling back on the rod tip. Yep. you're engaged you're creating tension we got deep okay. water okay dirty water yep. fish are on the bottom so we need basically a sacrificial period of time to get our flies down a little sooner right up right. there rather than here okay so when you cast yeah don't immediately lift up with the rod tip, but instead just stick to make the cast, but then just point the rod tip towards the cider and actually hold the rod tip and draw in the line with the line hand. Okay. You'll let that cider drop a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you can engage with the rod tip moving downstream. Okay, so. Point, draw in a little bit of line, now elevate. Now we're ticking bottom a little sooner, a little higher up, and we have control from the very start uh, okay, to the bottom. Okay, so. So. Draw in line. Good, now you can elevate. Now see how yeah, we're, now we're hitting bottom yeah, so much yeah, earlier? Yeah. Yep, so we're just creating a little bit of manageable slack earlier on to give our flies time to hit the bottom. The angle and distance between the cider and the water surface is critical, depending on water depth and speed. You need to vary this depending on conditions. And every time you move just a bit, this can change. What kind of angle are you looking at between the cider and the tip it. So, like right now, I'm <clears throat> I'm trying to start higher, and then I'm gonna work my way lower. But we have kind of a, a fairly middle grade stream right here. So we go from shallow to a little deeper. So initially, when I'm making my cast, my setter is gonna be at a shallower angle in the skinnier water, which means my flies are shallow. But as soon as I go into this drop off. I'm going to be elevating my rod tip so my cider goes a little more vertical, which tells me my flies are going to be a little deeper in the, in the water column. So, so you're elevating the rod We're going to tip. elevate here just a little bit. We're going to begin leading the flies immediately here in the fairly shallow. And then as soon as we go into that drop off, we can go vertical. Now we're ticking bottom. A, a nice gradual drop off. It went from light to dark. So with this technique, basically, I, I made a cast, kind of just started dredging my fly right along the shallow. But as soon as we started going over that drop off, I just paused, hesitated, allowed that fly to sink about a foot, foot and a half, and then regain the lead, and he was right on the drop when it took. So this was just allowing me to kind of work the contours. And what a nice, man, this is such a gorgeous fish.
we have a lot of wind. So all we're gonna do, again, starting with the rod tip at a level height, we're gonna make the forward cast stroke point this okay. rod tip right at the cider, one long draw, but keep in part, always keeping part of that cider just lifted off the water. Okay. That's all we're doing. Just so, a little bit. Just a little bit. So instead of casting and doing all the line control with the rod tip, keeping a higher rod tip, allowing that wind to basically push that sail around, all yeah. we're gonna do is we're gonna square back up, make our forward cast a stroke, stiff arm, hand out, one long draw of the line hand, keeping the cider tight, and then we can resume leading the fly in the presentation. But that just keeps things tight and reduces the overall length of the line off the water. So George, how do you tell the difference between bottom and a strike? Because they're both a hesitation, right? They're both a hesitation. And to be honest with you, I think still the best anglers in the world are not able to always distinguish between the two. Okay. Uh, the big thing is, is having confidence in the weight of your rig. If you have too much weight on there and you're constantly hitting bottom, you know, for me, I like to hit bottom maybe like two or three out of every 10 presentations where I'm kind of snagging on the bottom. That seems to be a nice ratio. Okay. So when the fly does hit or hesitate or the cider hesitates, I know the set, but if, if my fly is snagging the bottom each and every time, yeah. I quickly lose confidence in setting the hook. So that you hold, you hold the rod a little higher then? Correct. You, uh -huh. and, that's, and that's the great thing about with this technique is all you need to do is essentially your cider, this colored piece of monofilament that we're using, we could use it as a depth gauge. So just kind of figure out how high or the angle your sight is off the water. And if you're snagging bottom on a regular basis, all you need to do is just basically hold it a little higher, just work in smaller increments. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I noticed that as I'm watching your sight, it, it is bouncing. I can see it kind of little hesitations, but um, you don't strike to those because you, it doesn't, doesn't, it isn't a longer pause, is that Correct. What and that's okay. why I'm using a longer cider and sometimes yeah. with these little tags, but one of the things you'll notice when you're drifting, when the flies are drifting on the bottom and your shots just literally just, or your, your shot or your flies are ticking along the bottom, you'll see just like a nervous twitch. Uh -huh. And often when you see that nervous twitch hold tight for you know half a second to okay. a second, that's usually an indicator that it's either stuck on the bottom or a fish has inhaled the fly. Ah, okay. So I'm looking essentially for that nervous twitch to end. Okay. And again, that's why it's really important to get your weights kind of dialed in so you maintain that nice little ticking motion. Finally, you can further modify your presentation by adding weight. Sometimes you can do it by going to a heavier fly, but you can also add split shot. Weight on the leader is not allowed in competition fishing, but it's just fine for us civilians. As I'm working the shallow shelf, we were ticking bottom, but as soon as I went another four or five feet out, we got some depth, a little more current, and I stopped ticking bottom. So all I'm gonna do is just switch to a fly with one bead size heavier. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's those times of the year, as you know, Tom, where it doesn't really matter what you do, what level you put the fly, they come up out of the bottom, but then there are times like right now where yeah. you've, gotta, you've gotta almost force feed them. So now you're gonna switch again. We're gonna switch again, or oh. we're kind of maxed out with the size of the beads right yeah. now. This is a 532nd. Yeah. So now we're just gonna add a, a tiny little shot. Okay, between the two flies. Between the two flies, and just more, closer four or five inches above the, the point fly or the bottom fly. Mm -hmm. You can even modify your presentation by switching to a drop shot rig, which puts the weight on the bottom and stalls the flies, suspending them above the weight. What are you gonna try? What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a modification with a drop shot. I'm just not seeing as much action either on the surface or on the swing right now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to stall my flies in the, in the column slower. So we're gonna use a drop shot, tight line system, contact nymphing, but we're gonna put shot on the bottom and just really crawl our flies uh, on the bottom, but at a much slower path than what we were doing, which we were basically drifting just a few minutes ago. Okay, so when you rig for that, you took off your bottom fly. Bottom fly. You tied a surgeon's knot. Yep, with another section of tippet. With, and left a dropper for your second fly. Correct. And then you put an overhand knot in the end of the tippet. Correct. And then you're gonna put a shot on the bottom. We're gonna put several shots. Several shots on the bottom. 
So they're gonna, the shot's going to roll along the bottom and your flies are going to stay just above the bottom. Correct. Okay. So anytime you're fishing a drop shot technique with a lot of weight or a very heavy point fly, the amount of tension between the rod tip and the, and the fly is immense. So when the fish strikes, you're almost 90% positive it's going to be a fish. With drop shot. With a drop uh -huh. shot in a heavy rig, just because of the amount of tension. So right here, you can you can really, with this with the amount of weight that I'm using right now, yep. we can basically feel our way through this whole situation, uh -huh. knowing when the fish strikes versus when bottom occurs. Learning to catch trout with the Euro Niffing technique is almost like learning to fish all over again. And I really enjoyed learning a new skill and getting outside of my comfort zone. With George's guidance, I finally put it all together in conditions where I never would have thought I'd be very successful. There's a fish. There we go. There's nice. a nice, decent fish by the head shakes. In this heavy water, this rimf, this riffle dumping in here. A uh, little soft water on the side here. I was hoping there'd be something sitting in here, and there was. Took the mop fly, which has been the uh, the deadly fly for all of us. Nice little brown trout, barbless hook on the roof of the mouth, so. We'll just grab him here, keep him in the water, and take that barbless hook out of his mouth. Beautiful fish. Beautiful little fish. All right, buddy. Thanks for watching the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I hope you've enjoyed this episode on Euro Nymphing with George Daniel. I know that I have learned a ton in this show. And I know that I'm gonna be able to go out on a river and use this technique when things are tough and have a lot more confidence in catching fish. I really feel a lot better about it. And I'm sure that you do after watching all these great tips from George. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Oscar Blues Brewery.